I've heard over the years. And I've got so many good things from the raw vegan diet and the community of people that practice and learn and teach about it. But I started to think as well, I'd seen negative things over the years. I'd seen people that actually had health issues or had experienced negative, um, had experienced some harm in some, in some cases. And sometimes the information that they'd learned had come from the raw vegan community or from the alternative health movement. And we really don't want people to come to harm. We really want to have a message that's very positive and good. Our message should be that we've got this fantastic, healthy diet. We feel like we work something really good out that really helps a lot of people, reverses a lot of illness and conditions and helps people to thrive at, the, at their highest level. And we should only have positive experiences and positive ideas and healthy, happy, long-living, positive people. And unfortunately, that's not always the case. So there's people that fall off the diet. It's not that uncommon for that to happen. There's people that um, pick up ideas and try things that are maybe a little bit extreme. There are people that... Um, are constantly trying to find improvement, being obsessed with the diet and things like that. So we're really looking for some kind of happy medium here where people can use this diet, not as an obsession, not as an extreme thing, but as a solid foundation for you to build the rest of your life upon. And we're not here, as Doug was saying yesterday, it's not just about food, but people make a lot of mistakes with food. And that's why we do need to put some time and effort and think about it. But we don't want to uh, sort of take it too far and become our life obsession. Ronnie, could you sort your shout out so I can take a photo of him for granted? What do you want me to do? Sort your shout out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. So, this new one. so, what do I mean by a myth definition? There is a couple of definitions of myth. So I'm talking about a widely held but false belief or idea. Does anyone want to shout out something that they think that they've heard either in an alternative health community or raw, even the raw vegan movement? Dry fasting. Was a myth. Dry fasting. So, you will, actually going to talk about this in the talk, so I'll, I'll not go over that right now, but any, any other ones? They're drinking uh, apple cider vinegar. Apple cider vinegar. Interesting. So there's a, that, that could be, for example, um, do you mean like every day or is that... Yeah, a, a, before the meals. Right, right, and there might be some Water. benefits to that, but do we, has anyone ever looked into it really deeply? Like, what's the real truth about that? Um, mm -hmm. Kieran, you want to say one? I was going to say, um, it looks like, like a cult. A cult? Yeah, like, uh, <laughs> it'd be good if we had a cult, you know, we'd have a bit more structure or something, we'd get loads of people mm -hmm. in, we'd have people out in the street the offering. What's that, sorry? Yeah, in the fortune. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> no, as a cult leader. But I, I, I like, annoy too many people to be a cult leader. People like, they, they, if people come to you and they want you to be their leader, I'm, I'm not that great at like, playing that role for them. But um, yeah, the, I, 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 and that's what I think. A lot of times, the like, cult leader thing, like that comes from like people believing into these big ideas. It's just like the cult leader would be saying, "Oh, there's this enemy out there, and I'm going to lead you all to the, the you know, the, the promised land." And I, I, you know, I think that you got to be skeptical of anyone trying to sell you on utopia and perfect life and all that. Alkaline diet. Al alkaline, that's interesting, and, and Matthew might talk about that. Even the whole concept of alkalinity, what does that even mean? Um, and Doug Graham's been a big myth buster for me, things like al alkaline, you know, he talks about the body has very set limits for its pH, and we can't really influence that much um, with, with our diet, you know, regardless of what we do. It will do things to compensate and keep our blood and everything else in a, in a really strict, Guideline. Any other ones anyone wants to shout out? Protein. Minus protein. protein. Just the general myth about protein that we re require meat for protein, that we need tons of protein. Um, so a lot of these ones, there's, there's myths that are in the mainstream that are huge about protein connected to meat, about calcium and milk, about, um, I don't know, iron and red meat, about eggs are the a complete source of protein and, and many other ones that, that are floated out there. And we found over the years that when we come into learning about the raw vegan diet, 
for just the plant-based diet, we find that a lot of these things aren't accurate. And there's not a lot of the science around some of these things often. But we can but there are still things within the raw vegan diet and in the community that are, are also not accurate. So why do I want to talk about this? Well, when it comes to health, making good choices is actually more difficult. And I think that a lot of people, what we want sometimes, our tendency is to look for a very simple rule. We love this idea of like a binary, sort of. Um, like, like the concept of raw food at one time, I want to talk about this a little bit, was as long as it's raw, it's healthy. So a really simple way of, if that was the rule, that would be really simple and easy, right? If it's raw, it's healthy, and that's all you need to worry about. And very interestingly, I'm literally, and I'm looking for these stories all the time now, and there was a man yesterday, and I've interviewed him before, and he's a very um, interesting man. He's been a raw vegan for about 20 years. He's in his 70s now. Uh, he has had a very interesting life, and him and his wife have put out a lot of things about raw food. They've done DVDs, they used to do lecture tours. Successful guy, very interesting. But he posted the thing the other day to say that he was suffering from coronary artery disease. And he was saying to his audience, you know, do you think I'm gonna focus on the medicine or do you think I'm gonna focus on the, the, natu the natural approach? And there was many people in the comment section completely confused. <coughs> you know, how are you got this? How can you eat so healthy and have coronary artery disease? And Part of this comes from this idea that at one time people said and thought, as long as it's raw, it's healthy. If it's raw, it's healthy. Uh, and an interesting thing was, a, 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 so the, the, infir the information on heart disease is Dr. Dean Ornish, Dr. Caldwell Estestein, at least two of them, but the information goes back farther than that. We can reverse heart disease with dietary change and it doesn't need to be a raw diet. It, it can be a very low fat diet of almost any description and people can reverse or arrest heart disease with progressing. And so the question was, what was this man eating that might have been creating this heart disease? Was it just he had really bad genetics or something? And it turns out that in his 50s, he'd already been starting to get issues of heart disease and that's when he started to go raw and find out about the raw vegan diet. And a friend of mine um, was messaging me about this, and he messaged the man and said, it might be time for you to consider a low-fat approach and giving up you know, the coconut oil and stuff like that. And the man replied to him, I've never eaten coconut oil in my life, mm -hmm. right? And what was so confusing about this is that my friend then sent to me multiple screenshots of this man posting pictures, post making posts, making vlogs about how he was eating more coconut oil, about his coconut oil recipes, about the fact that coconut oil was good for, uh, he actually said, I'd rather die of a heart attack than of Alzheimer's, and apparently coconut oil is good for Alzheimer's or something like that. Mm -hmm. And people get, it's really weird that people kind of lie about their diet or, or get delusional about it, but you know, um, we see this sometimes, that people buy into these concepts if it's raw, it's healthy. If it's plant-based, it's healthy. Well, we actually need to sometimes look a little bit more, discriminate a little bit more, and, and think about further into it. We can't just sell sometimes for these, these simple answers. So we want to have simple solutions sometimes. Unfortunately, that's it's not always, life isn't always as black and white in that, as that. And at the end of the day, wrong choices with your health that it can be extremely dangerous, it's very important to make sure you've got really strong, really good information, that you're not just falling for a personal bias and or, or something you want to believe is true. And, um, you know, I, I love the idea, we talked about the law of attraction a little bit yesterday, and there's many people that want to believe, well, I just need to think positively and that's it. And that, and although there's the law of attraction, there are other laws in, in the universe also at play, and you need to be aware of all of these. So. You can't be thinking that positively and that you're gonna get healthy, but then acting in complete non-alignment with that. You know, you can't just, because then you're not really acting in, in line with the law of attraction anyway. So people get caught up in magical thinking, mystical thinking, miracles, you want 
miraculous things that happen, they get caught up in these beautiful ideas, and unfortunately sometimes it's not accurate. There's also a bias that we have. So we have a, a lot of inbuilt biases as humans. Part of this comes from the fact that we really are designed to kind of um, to avoid complexity if we can to some degree, to, to keep things simple. Uh, we don't want to change. We've got all sorts of biases in us. And so we sometimes go towards the familiar and we stay away from the complicated and sometimes the complicated is what, is what actually will work. Changing your lifestyle is a complicated thing to do. So we, we prefer maybe the supplement to work or the, the mantra or the thought process to work, but often it's, a, it's an entire upheaval of your life, which is very difficult to do. There's also the appeal to nature fallacy, which is the idea that many people have this kind of binary concept of, as long as it's natural, then it's healthy, or if it's natural, it's better. If it's man-made, it's bad, or we can be skeptical about it, but if it's natural, it's probably okay. And that is often the case as well, but not 100% of the time, you know. So we, we, we talk about a natural diet, a more natural diet, and that being a good thing. Whole foods, which are a natural food, better than processed foods. We've yet to make man-made food that is better than whole foods. I, I think we can agree on that. But at the same time, um, there are natural foods that are certainly worse for us than processed food for absolute certainty, for absolute sure, because there are many things in nature that are poisonous and highly poisonous, highly, highly toxic. And some people will have their own personal difficulties with certain foods that are natural, and uh, they won't have some of those difficulties with, with some processed foods, for example. So it's not always that, that as easy as one thing or the other. Um, my own personal experiences, as I say, I've seen people come to harm from following ideas they've learned. And that's, that's really sad to me because I just think that if you're making this effort to change your diet, change your lifestyle, you get this incredible message and then you do one thing or you follow one idea or take one track that takes you in the wrong direction, then that's, to me, a really sad thing. And I've seen it happen a, a couple of times now. I continue to meet people buying into and spreading ideas that I believe are dangerous. At the festival, we have a number of topics that we don't talk about, that we don't allow to be talked about. Some of them are quite limited, um, as they are a little bit more, uh, there's a little bit more of a risk to them, even if it's a small risk. There's, there's virtually no risk to people eating more fruit. There's very little that can go wrong there. But things like fasting, uh, it can be a wonderful thing. People do it under supervision and all this stuff, but there are occasions where people have done it wrong, went and done it on their own, went to a cave somewhere. Uh, th these, th these risks are, are inherent in some of these ideas and practices, and so we have to be a bit careful about how we present the information. Unusual practices, they become almost like a religion. Uh, we're talking about the cult leader thing. Uh, some people want to be that maybe, they like the attention and they start to say things, just kind of making things up because they want, they, they get, people are attracted to certain ideas and claims. And it's very hard when people have bought into some of these ideas to get them to accept even very strong evidence to the contrary. And I think that we're all liable to that as well. I'm not saying that uh, I don't have some, you know, mistruths in me that I need to figure out, but, um, I'm definitely on a path of trying to question everything a lot now and really question even the basic foundations of everything and if something came out, I'm, I'm open to the fact of someone coming out with something that debunks the whole diet or, or says we definitely need animal products or whatever, like I'm, I'm happy to hear that if that's the case I, I, we should accept that as being right and, and, and I'm open to that so I'm not trying to develop a religion or be, a, be religious about the diet um, and, uh, and I'm trying to question and read. So that's why I wanted to do the book as well because I wanted to, I was saying some of these things already but I didn't really have the research behind it. So some of the topics I covered in the book, nutrition, and I realize there's many more things I want to talk about so I'll probably do a follow up, but nutrient deficiency, Raw vegans don't require medication, soil depletion, supplements, nutrient density, 
So it's an interesting concept that the more nutrition in a food means it's a healthier food for you. Something to talk about that. Easier to go raw in the tropics. Sex drive in the raw vegan diet. Uh, there's a lot of different claims around that. Urine therapy, which is not really taught by a lot of raw vegan people, but it, mm -hmm. it is. If you go to the events, you'll often meet people that are trying it out. So you'll, you'll see it, you'll see people doing it. <coughs> Dry fasting and breatharianism, which are the two topics that we don't speak about at the UK for best mostly. Um, we're, we're, yeah, I'll, and I'll talk about that today. So I'm gonna talk about these ones. Nutritional deficiency, supplementation, soil depletion. So these things are all a bit linked, and I hope to put together a, a, a good little argument on that. And I'll talk about those ones as well. The rest of it in the book, there's a lot more detail in the book. And it's only about 112 pages, so it's fairly easy to read as well. So in the press, if you look up the raw vegan diet, if you just Google online or something, what you'll see, uh, here's three of the, the top articles I came up with on Google. And I'm not sure if you can read that, but the first one says, a raw vegan diet devoid of supplements to be low in B12, iodine, calcium, vitamin D, may provide too little protein, too few calories, leading to an array of health issues, may also cause tooth decay and fertility issues. The second uh, says, this is everydayhealth.com, people who follow raw vegan diet increase risk of not enough B12, calcium, iron, also need to be sure you get proper amounts of EPA and DHA. Third result, so diff slightly different, <laughs> slightly different, but raw vegan diet excludes a wide range of foods, so there's a risk that a person may not get all the vitamins and minerals they need. That statement is a false statement uh, in and of itself. But anyway, 2019 reports that the raw vegan diet may not provide enough protein, vitamin B12, vitamin D, iron, calcium, selenium, and zinc. Which is, uh, so this is what you'll find claims of raw vegan diet is deficient, and many people will believe it's by it. Sorry, there's a response. Sorry, yeah, I was just saying, like a, like a normal diet. Yeah, and, and that's, that, so that is the thing as well, like th there is risks with, with every diet really, and there's, there's not great evidence, for example, it's a standard diet that most people eat is, uh, is very healthy for them. But I wanted to approach that anyway, I didn't want to come up with a simple answer. But I think I want to talk about like the fear of deficiency, like why do we have this worry about deficiency? and not getting enough when we live in a world of absolute abundance like and even if you did suffer from a deficiency what's the where's the big fear of this you've got this every supplement is now understood like every every nutrient we know we know all the ones that we need we can go and get them on the shelves if you're really that worried about it you can go to doctors and everything that can help you there's not there's, it should be something that people really worry about uh, the, the real major diseases at the moment are chronic disease which generally come from nutritional excesses, people eating too much. But there's a history of deficiencies, there's a fear around it. I think it comes from the fact that as an animal, like many animals, our dietary history was we didn't get enough. That was the, the challenge, the puzzle of life for millions and millions of years, trying to get enough, trying to get enough food. So that's the mindset we come from, and we still really have that mindset. Get enough, make sure you get enough, get more. And that kind of leads to, in this world of abundance, we have a lot of obesity and everything. So, but anyway, where did the whole deficiency idea come from? This, uh, from about the 17th, 18th century onwards, we started to identify various conditions as being nutritional deficiencies. There was major resistance to that being the case. The, the medical community at the time had all sorts of weird ideas as to what it might have been that why people were sick and the, the simple solution that was uh, in front of them uh, they often didn't accept but we have scurvy we have very very pellagra horrific diabetes night flight these are ones that i that i put because the large populations of people suffered from them millions of people large groups of people population wide deficiencies so these are the ones that were really studied that led to the whole science around nutrition, that led to all the nutri nutrients being uh, analyzed, the death, you know, and uh, to this kind of uh, reductionist view of nutrition, of reducing everything down to its bare parts. Then I didn't, know, I, I didn't know iodine was a, um, a condition. 
Well, this is the iodine deficiency. Yeah, so I didn't. It's, I've not really made food. Yeah, oh, okay. I mean. yeah. So it's, yeah. So the rest of them. So scurvy. Uh, anyone know what causes scurvy? I would assume. Vitamin C. Everyone knows that, right? Everyone, absolutely everyone knows that now. Um, and vitamin C is in what? Oranges, fruit, citrus, citrus fruit, everything, you know. And basically almost everything you eat has some form of scurvy. Animal products are pretty low and grains are pretty low. So when sailors went out on ships for many months, living on dry breads, living on dried meats, uh, <coughs> they became deficient of vitamin C. Weirdly enough, some of them didn't. Like, I don't know if some of the others had other foods. So it seemed like the captain and all these, like they, they seemed okay, but it was the sailors who did badly. So they might have had other things. But scurvy actually, it's really difficult to get scurvy. Even if you've got raw animal products, you, you, there's probably a, enough vitamin C in there to stop you getting scurvy, certain raw animal products. So he was like, he was thinking they might have been taking fish out of the ocean, but anyway, they were living on these breads and maybe some dried meat and they developed scurvy and there's a whole and I go into the story of all that but scurvy is very simply uh, dealt with, with and it's terrible people die of it millions died it was a real problem they couldn't work it out for years and it was really just uh, just it was, it was just fresh they needed fresh food but really fruits and vegetables fruits being the best source of vitamin C anyone know about berry berry anything else about, about that White rice. White rice, absolutely. Polished rice in Japan. Uh, so even actually if they'd had just whole grain rice, but they had polished rice, many people just lived on rice. So it was an issue of poverty as well. And it was a vitamin B1 deficiency, and it led to this condition, berry berry. You can, eat, you can get that from long-term fasting as well. You can go low in vitamin B1 if you do very, very long-term fasting and you'll eat for a long time. Uh, I've heard of a person that's got berry berry from that. But no one gets very berry nowadays. No one gets scurvy. It's really super difficult to get these. Uh, pellagra, anyone know anything about that one? B3. Vitamin B3, niacin. Anyone know where that happened? That happened in the US in the 20th century. Uh, it also happened in Italy. It was people living on corn, um, weirdly enough. Uh, particular no, I don't think it was sweet corn, but a particular type of corn. And it was low in vitamin B3, but uh, there are other cultures that have lived on corn, like the Incas, the Aztecs, people in um, South America, Central America, but they actually have a process called nixtamalization, where they take the corn and they put it in lime, and I'm not talking about the fruit, I'm talking about the alkali, they put it in the alkali lime, it actually helps to bring out the, um, the vitamin B3 in it, but this was millions of people in America suffered from this, and um, and also, and all of these things were studied by various people and they took people and put them on different diets and tried to work out what was happening. Doesn't happen anymore, once again, very simple solution. Rickets, you know about that one? Anyone know? Sorry? Vitamin D? Yeah, yeah, vitamin D actually. Um, rickets. Mostly occurred, does anyone know where it happened, how it happened, why it happened? Quite, quite interesting. It was mostly really kind of children working in factories and things like that. And people working in factories. I remember about 100, 150 years ago, we were creating a lot of smoke. So in big cities, the sky was full of smoke. So the sunlight's already getting kind of prevented from coming through. It's not the ideal place to get sunlight. And they're working indoors in factories in the Industrial Revolution. Maybe all day long they never see sunlight. And the children were working as well. And they develop vitamin D deficiency rickets. And at the very extreme, it causes like issues with the, with the bones and things like that. Um, but people that get low in vitamin D don't tend to get rickets. Uh, they don't tend to, it doesn't tend to go that far. Um, and it's simply, you really need to, as I say, you really need to be avoiding the sun. But back then, the conditions were worse. That's why people used to go out to the country, you know, and they felt so much better because all of a sudden they've got sunlight, they've got fresh air, they're not living in pollution 100% of the time. Uh, iodine, does anyone know the uh, symptom that comes up with iodine deficiency? Capsaicin. Yeah. 
guys are yeah, like big, big thing coming out of the side of your neck, basically. We don't really see a lot of people walking about with these anymore. It's, it's, and it's iodine still happens, iodine deficiency can happen because of soil being, uh, having iodine washed out in floods and things that can happen in parts of India. Um, and, and, and I believe it, and it did happen in the past, but we're talking about really areas where they were growing food in a particular geographical location and that soil was flooded and iodine was removed from the soil, or, or it was a low iodine area. And that's just a natural variation around the world. There's soil that has more iodine and less. And nowadays we have food from all over the world shipped to us and we have, and these things are checked. So we don't really see iodine deficiency. Uh, and um, sorry, it's, it's not a big problem at the moment. Night blindness, anyone know much about that one? It was it's a bit of a, Vitamin A, yeah. Uh, there was a bit of a kind of weird confrontation in the vegan movement, the plant-based doctors with, where uh, Dr. Michael Greger was claiming if you live on a potato diet, you can become, you can go blind. That was a statement. If you eat white potatoes and you live on them, you can go blind. And Dr. McDougall, as many of you heard of him, he, he responded to that and he was saying, well, what he's actually talking about is night blindness, which isn't blindness. You don't actually go blind but it affects your night vision. Uh, and this is still happens quite a lot in Africa. Uh, it would still be quite hard to get night blindness if you're living on white potatoes. I think uh, you'd have to be really basically living on for a long time. They are low in vitamin A, but um, anyway, night blindness, uh, it does happen still. Actually, there's some of the GMO stuff, I know a lot of people don't like GMO, but part of the, some of the GMO technology was about trying to add vitamin A into certain crops so that pe so that this didn't happen in certain parts of the world uh, that were more restricted in food supply. So there's, uh, they have actually added it into certain potatoes. So if you ever see a potato that says there's extra vitamin A, then it might be GMO, you know. Um, night blindness is very uncommon here and uh, a very few cases of it. You'd have to have a very restricted diet. And but these are like the major deficiencies that if you want to be worried about, like these have actually happened to many, many people who have just the, the very uh, bad for health. What what's do we have in common with all of these? None of these occurred on a vegan or raw vegan diet. Um, some of the people might have been vegan accidentally or not knowing it, but uh, the food might have been so restricted. But generally throughout the world, vegan is, hasn't been an ethic that people have particularly stuck to uh, in any place, especially if they've got a limited food supply. Many would have been solved, basically almost all of these would have been solved by the addition of fruit to the diet, especially obviously scurvy, which we, we know for sure. But the rest of them, the, the all, especially a lot of the vitamin ones, fruit is an exceptional source. So should we really be concerned about the raw vegan diet being deficient when what we see is a history of deficiency on other diets? We don't see this history of deficiency on people eating fruits and vegetables. We see it when people actually don't have fruits and vegetables or don't have as much fruit and vegetables or don't have fresh food uh, at their, you don't have access to fresh food. Concerns for raw vegans, little evidence supports the idea that raw vegan diet is deficient in minerals or nutrition based on macro and micronutrients. A vegan diet is appropriate for all stages of life, as, we, as we've seen, and the, the major dietetical associations have said that. Why would it be different on a raw food diet? You know, if you're not cooking the food, why is a cooked vegan diet any different than a raw food diet? So I, I see that that statement would, would apply to raw pretty much straight away, but maybe it's not as simple as that. But there's not a lot of evidence around deficiency in the raw vegan diet. Some of the studies, some of the studies around, I don't know if any of you have researched some of the studies in the raw vegan diet or the raw food diet. A lot of them are raw food diet studies. Some of them are raw vegan diet studies. And when you look at the participants in the studies, they're often not vegan. They're rarely 100% raw. They're rarely eating a fruit-based diet. You know, these are, studies going back a while back, and there's people that ate more raw food, and for example, there was one where a lot of the people were underweight, or, or there was more people underweight than in general in the population, and that's where we get these, some of these statements about a raw food diet being uh, 
there's studies saying this and that, but really the people were just underweight and that was their real concern. Um, so anyway, but what about vitamin B12 and vitamin D? These are the ones that vegans tend to have concerns about and uh, they're even a concern for, for a lot of people in the population. But vitamin D, does anyone, does anyone generally think that vegans have lower B12 or uh, vitamin D, sorry, sorry about vitamin D. For all vegans, do you think they would have lower vitamin D generally? No. You don't think? So there is actually a study, now there's not a lot of studies, so there's not a huge amount of research, but I, I was reading through this study, it's really interesting, it's, uh, it's referenced in the book as well, that actually had about 15 raw vegans and 15 people of a normal diet. They were actually looking at the bone status, but they also measured, measured vitamin D. They were surprised that the raw vegans had higher vitamin D than the average member of the population in the standard diet. The reason, the conclusion for that was the raw vegans were more conscious about getting sunlight, which is the best source of vitamin D. They were more conscious of the fact that they need to go out and get sunlight. I don't know if this is the case with people you've met in your family, but I I think my, my grandmother died a number of years ago. I don't think she ever went out in the sun. Like, I think she was just inside her house all the time. It felt like she stayed away from the sun, you know? And it's, it's not a surprise that, that a lot of people aren't getting the amount of vitamin D they need, you know? The funny thing, vitamin D is supplemented for animals. You know, if you've got cats and dogs, it's one of the things that's added into animal uh, foods for, for dogs and cats. Um, and uh, vitamin D is actually a widespread issue. It's not a vegan issue. If you go on the NHS website, it'll say that everyone in a, in a country like this should be a bit concerned about their, their vitamin D. But um, generally, you get it from sunlight. It might be an idea to take a, a winter holiday rather than a summer holiday and get some sun. B12 is a concern for vegans. Generally, in the scientific information, B12 is seen as being lower in vegans than in other groups. And, uh, and sometimes clinically uh, low as well and, and, and within the levels of deficiency. It's definitely something to be aware of. It's not, I don't think it's a major thing to be worried about. There's a good solution to it. You can supplement, it's not really an issue. It's added into a lot of mainstream foods as well. A lot of people are being supplemented with B12 anyway. But there was this study about raw vegans or vegans because that was Big difference. Oh, well, so there's a lot of studies with B12. vegans, oh, yeah. but so that's there is a study with raw vegans on B12 and they were lower than usual as well. Now, that doesn't mean they were suffering from deficiency, symptoms, it wasn't harming their life, but they were lower than, than general. And, and that's all, I mean, I personally aren't worried about it. I, I don't supplement, I'm not supplementing B12 in a while, but that's just my own personal kind of uh, thoughts about it. I'm not so worried about it. and. I, I, but I'm not recommending other people don't worry about it. It's something to be concerned with, something to be aware of. You can test if you like, you can go to your doctor and all that stuff. Um, I personally think it's probably not as much of an issue as it's been made out to be, but don't take, don't take that as being me telling you what to do. It's, 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 it's definitely, um, and in the book actually, there is a study where people were found to be creating B12 in their gut and and all that, but it might have been the fact that it was actually the water they were drinking, it was in India, and the water they were drinking was actually contaminated with fecal matter, and that was maybe where the B12 was coming from. <laughs> and in a lot of apes, they actually eat their uh, waste products, so they maybe get some B12 from that. But um, I tend to think they were making some inside us, or, or in, that's what Doug seems to suggest, but does mean it's not an issue, something to be aware of. DHA, people are worried about that. Um, but, but in general, if you're eating enough omega-3, that covers you for all the other fats. I mean, it's, it's quite simple, but people go into this DHA thing, EPA and all the rest of it. So we've got, uh, let's go through. So raw vegan diet, example of vitamins. I, very simply, you can see vitamin B1, B2, B3, B5, I mean, vitamin A, we get it from beta carotene, vitamin C. It's, it's just, the fruits and vegetables we're eating are just so abundant in, in vitamins. And most of these worrisome deficiencies are actually vitamin based. What about soil depletion? So a lot of people go into it from there. Well, what about the soil depleted therefore? Well, you know, you can say that 
there's enough nutrition in the fruits and vegetables and all that, but we don't know if that nutrition is actually there. And so statements like this, this is just something I wrote, made up, but I've heard things like this. Something like, the food today is not what it once was. Modern farming techniques drive for greater profits. The use of more chemicals have led to depletion of the soil, of the nutrition of the soil, which has led to depleted food. This has led to widespread health issues. So some people want to put this idea across that this is why people are sick, is because the food supply is no good. This is very appealing to people because it takes away our personal responsibility. Well, it's not me that's, that's bad. The farmers made the mistake, and how could I be healthy? Because the food that they've given us is so bad, you know? That's the same in the books that I learned at school. Yeah, yeah, it's, um, is there any truth to this statement? It's really, so this is what I would say, that this is so widespread, this concept. It's so, it's been spread so much by many different sources. And uh, let's have, well, let's look into, and here you go, well, let's look, first of the soil depleted. Soil degradation does happen. Um, and there's statements like this in environmental documentaries and everything else. These spread like wildfire. This is this is someone from the direct, director general of the Food and Agricultural Association of the U.S., Maria Helena Semedo. All of the world's crop cells have been gone in 60 years. Have you heard statements like that? You see it in uh, environmentalist documentaries and things. Claims like this are often heard and they spread widely. But the specialists that work in these fields. Uh, in the book I reference it a lot. The stark claim that the world is only 160 or even 30 years of harvest left often hit the headlines. Although they continue to be repeated, there is no scientific basis. There's literally no study on this. There's no evidence. There's no, um, the, the specialists in the area do not agree with that kind of thing. They actually tell their, their students to watch out for that because it's misinformation. And this is a graph of uh, various soils that have been tested. And as you can see, there's Soils that might last a million years, 100,000 years, 10,000 years, 1,000 years. Um, so, and there is soil that, that, in the way that's being treated right now, it won't last. It might only last 100 years, but there's still quite a proportion. Where will, is the distribution geographically among that lot? Um, these places are talking about now. These, as far as I'm aware, this is worldwide information. The soil lifespan is 10 years. Yeah, but it's taking. Um, various types of soil. Bare soil is soil that they don't grow anything on. And that soil uh, becomes degraded more easily and they test that. And that's and so that's an unnatural type of soil. This is conventionally managed. Even conventionally managed, 18% has a lifespan of 10,000 years or more. And if it's if with con con conservation techniques, 39% of soil has more than 10,000 years. So this, the, the information about soil depletion is, is, is not particularly something we should you know, be concerned about, I would say. But does that mean that it could be linked to depleted nutrition, disaffecting your food? I came across a great article about all this. This guy, Robin J. Mile, um, he talks about that more. And basically what people have done is they've taken nutritional charts and they've looked at measurements from today, looked at measurements from the past and said, oh look, there's differences in the level of nutrition, nutrition's gone down. But um, the way that they have analyzed these things is pretty poor. They've not made direct comparisons. They've used different types of food. They've used different varieties. The, the varieties now that are grown are much different. There's a lot of different reasons. And none of these studies ever said there's a depletion in the soil. That's why the, there's a change in the nutrition. Some of the nutrients went up. Some of them went down. There's no uh, real thing. But people have grabbed onto these various studies and ideas and try to claim this means there's less nutrition in the food nowadays. Uh, and it really comes because it helps to sell various products, various ideas, supplements, a huge business and so on. American Dietetic Association, all of these mainstream sources, they say you get your nutrition from food, you don't need to worry about that. Is it time to stop worrying about nutrition and depleted soil? I would say so, but um, some people the people I know that are teaching this kind of stuff, when I've asked them for the evidence, they've not really been very forthcoming with any evidence on it. They just tell me there is evidence. If it was the case, should we then supplement very quickly? Um, well, the answer really is no about supplementation or multivitamins in the supplement market. Enormous, enormous businesses. Um, it's kind of like anyone can start a supplement company, so many people do. 
it's not a medicinal product, so it's not regulated, it's more of a food product, which is ironic. Um, they are a multi-billion dollar company, blah, blah, blah. And this is, the, this is where the stories come from. It's come from the selling of supplements, and as I say, people would rather eat a supplement than change their diet. It's a much simpler thing to do. But the, large, the largest meta-analysis of all the studies on supplements and vitamins basically shows um, have shown uh, no positive benefit and not really any negative negative side effect either but there are some smaller studies that have shown negative correlations around uh, the use of supplements uh, which is a bit worrying the people are taking them thinking it does something good and it might actually not do so why does the concept continue to sell I think that people I mean, I even like it. I'd love that to be true, you know. I'd love to be able to take something and it, it makes you healthier and all that. But um, unfortunately, unfortunately, we need to continue to eat delicious fruits and vegetables to get that, I'm afraid. Um, so yeah, as I say, that's, uh, there's a lot, lot more references in the book if you want to go through that. And I understand and say it independently if you want any particular part that you want to question. So uh, I've not got a lot of time left, but I'll go into these ones, cetarianism, and dry fasting has been other myths. Cetarianism is a lot, there's been a lot of religious figures and saints that have claimed to live without food. And people quite like the idea that they could, like mystical people that do magical things. And I love that idea. I love to be like mystical uh, beings, you know. But, um, and I think I, maybe I have, maybe we're all that as well. You know, I, I, this is my kind of feeling is like we're all kind of magical, right? We've all, we don't need to not eat to be miraculous in our own way. Um, but it's a concept that we can live without food. People claim they can sustain themselves on something else. Energy, sunlight, some natural fluid that they could produce. There's a lot of different things. There's been a number of people claimed to be breatharians. There's a guy called Wiley Brooks. He ran, I think he maybe still does run, the Breatharian Institute in America. You can go and look at that website. Uh, kind of interesting. And it's called, I think it's breatharian.com or something. And I go through that in the book. And Wiley was talking about being a breatharian in the 70s. He's had many followers. There are many people that saw him eat food all the time. And he, and he also has changed his ways. So now he says that, and this is very strange, you're not going to believe this really, but on his, all, his, all on his website. And uh, he's a fascinating guy. Like he says he was like the reincarnation of Jesus, Muhammad, Buddha. He's the reincarnation of everyone, right? And. Um, but McDonald's is a high vibrational food, so if you could, and McDonald's restaurants are protected by spiritual beings, and so you should go to McDonald's restaurants and have Diet Coke and uh, a quarter pounder or something like that. <laughs> and it's high, this, is actually, this is on his website, because people caught him eating this stuff, and then he would have to say, well, the reason I'm eating this is it's high vibrational food, is it? And it's very strange. Jazzy Sheen was an Australian, is an Australian lady. Um, there's stuff about her being tested and kind of caught a little bit. There's a, many followers of her have unfortunately passed away from trying to live without eating. And I won't go into these, are, I won't go into these too much, but these are other examples of people. And Genesis, I interviewed him recently, he now says it's a scam. And this was an Indian guy, he was tested, but there's a lot of uh, debate about how good the tests were. And, and also, the fact that someone can live without food for 10 days is not unusual, um, so uh, we're not really testing much. It's a compelling concept, there's a lot of people with, I think, different levels of eating disorder. Many people have problems with food, negative feelings about food, and we love the magical and mystical. And I lived with a person for a number of times, for a while, that believed breatharianism was their sole purpose in life, and it was quite horrible, to be honest, to see someone continually try and do this impossible task of living without food and failing miserably and going into cycles of depression and binging and it was just terrible to watch you know so I'm really against it for personal reasons I've, I just see it as being a waste of time I don't see any reason not to enjoy and eat food even if you could live without it I don't really see the, the big deal to do that uh, I mean, what else are you going to do with your time, really? I mean, you, <laughs> like, you really want to save another couple of hours or whatever? 800 people, people are dying a year of hunger. 9 million die every year from, uh, from or, or in hunger. 900 actually die from hunger. We had the Irish hunger strikes in the 80s. It happened in uh, British prisons. 
commonly, you can see the list of, of them, of how many of them lasted. They died between 50 and 70 days without food. Some of them actually survived to 70 days without food and were hospitalized. Some of them have long-term health issues as a result. There's uh, the Minnesota starvation experiment. Anyone who Argus, Angus Barbieri is? It's from Fife in Scotland. This is Angus Barbieri. It's really weird to be the longest ever documented passenger guy from Scotland, right? this guy, <laughs> Angus Barbieri. He was the son of a chip shop owner. He was 31 stone. Wow. And he went into a hospital basically and said, I'm going to stop eating for a while. If you want to study me, you can. And maybe you can supervise me. And in uh, 13 months, he lost 22 stone. Or something like that. He got down to 13 stone. Um, and what he did was, he uh, it was not a complete fast because he did have supplements and different things he was taking, electrolytes, I think. Um, there were some things that he was taking but he was essentially not eating any food. He might have, I don't know if he had any lipids, but to lose that amount of weight in 13 months, you really have to have been eating like all, basically nothing. And he survived and actually he maintained that weight pretty much his whole life. So it kind of worked for him. Maybe there's more people that should uh, be forced to do this or should do it or whatever. But it's a very strange story, very unusual. And um, if you're extremely overweight, maybe you can last a long time with food if you have supplements to make sure that you've got uh, uh, the vitamins and things to keep you going, because you can maybe get enough from your body fat for uh, just your basic energy. Amazing. Um, I don't really advise you doing that, but anyway, try fasting is, is living without water, uh, or going without water and food for a while. People sometimes do this for um, health reasons. Well, fasting.